I'm Jim Mundorf. This is Lonesome Lands podcast uh, number five now, I think. Um, this one I talked to Brett Kinsey, and this one, this one was kind of tough for me, um, just because I feel like we're it's really important, and it, it was hard for me to kind of convey that. I think. Um, but I wanted to talk to I wanted to talk to Brett because um, he's a rancher and a cattle feeder in South Dakota. He's also the president of of RCAF, which is a national cattlemen's organization. But he's also a thinker. He, he's I, you can tell when I talk to him um, that he thinks a lot about a lot of different issues, um, and he and he researches and reads and and is really well informed. But the really the the reason I wanted to talk to him is because in my last video or podcast, I was, it was me speaking in South Dakota. And during that, I was talking about a grant that South Dakota State University is getting where I kind of fumbled around and with, with the money, because I said, I, I said, I didn't really understand it because South Dakota State was getting 80 million from the federal government. And then they were getting 81 million, which was called a non-federal match. And, and little did I know, I guess that the answer to, to why I didn't understand that was in in my email. Brett had emailed me, and I I was so busy getting getting around to get out there and and kind of get the get the everything lined out to where I was prepared to talk in front of people, which I don't do a whole lot of. Um, that I just kind of missed the email, and when I went back and read it, and found that he had emailed me what is called the Sustains Act. And what that does is, is it just lays it out that it's a public-private partnership with government where corporations can now just partner with the USDA um, to push these, these carbon measurements onto farmers and ranchers. Um, and corporations have, I talk about in the podcast, have it, it's what's documented, and I don't think everything is being included, um, but what's documented is I came up with 760 some million dollars um, that corporations have given to the USDA, and then they get back, the USDA then gives back to corporate America $3.1 billion, and, and it's all done under the, des- the this design to get farmers and ranchers to what they are now calling MMRV. It's it's so well known in the, in the, these corporate um, sustainability type industry and with the USDA that they they have an acronym and that's measurement, monitor, report, and verify. And those those four words I feel like should be the scariest thing that that agriculture or independent farmers and ranchers are are now having to deal with. Um, so here is Brett Kenzie. So you're currently feeding cattle in South Dakota. Um, where is that where you started out from? Yep. Yep. We've been here since Homestead. My family has. I'm the fourth generation. Uh, Dad died in 12. So my brother and I formed an official partnership, I guess, because dads and sons get all these deals going and we had to merge them into one and uh, kept my mother involved. She helps us every day, but uh, we've got a cow calf herd and we feed cattle. We feed our own. We do a little custom work too. That's kind of our our in t- you know, everybody has off farm income. We're fortunate enough to have our off farm income right here on the farm. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good way of life. I guess I grew up in the eighties, right? Tough times. There was plenty of stress. I, I knew this was, I say it's a good way of life, but I knew <laughs> I wasn't naive to the, the stress and the risk involved in this way of life. So I guess that tempered tempered my outlook early on uh i went to the army for three years out of college just uh initially to be honest for college money that's why i went what year was that 1990 to 1993 okay um you know went in for college money uh i would say it had a really pretty profound impact on me just meeting people from all over the country different colors men and women from different socioeconomic backgrounds that could just come together and work towards a common cause. And I suppose, you know, that's a part of what, uh, 
it's what I still enjoy, you know, in organizations is just people from all over bringing their perspectives together. But anyway, yeah, went to the, <clears throat> did a hardship tour with the United States Army in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I lucked out. Desert Storm was going on during that time. I didn't have to go. So, I mean, we trained hard because it was always there. But yet, yeah, I was still in Hawaii for that. So I definitely had kind of a golden a golden tour in the army, got out of the army, went to SDSU in Brookings, got an animal science degree. Uh, and I guess I had had my fun in the army. I came home about every weekend I was in college and worked and graduated college and just kind of stepped into it. Straight back to the ranch, huh? After college. Straight back to the ranch. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. I, and so what I was have been working on is all the sustainability stuff. And I've been talking to you for a long time, kind of going back and forth on the sustainability stuff. And and you had emailed me a bill and said that you lost sleep lost sleep over it. Um and the bill is this it's called it was initially called the Sustains Act. Um and so this was do you want to describe it or do you want me to go over it? Um it was passed through the Senate, right? And then it was put into an omnibus, which is one of these gigantic bills filled with everything that they can think of and, and that they don't have time to read, and then it gets passed. Um, and what it is, it's the, the first sentence kind of sums it up, I feel like. To amend the Food Security Act of 1985 with respect to the acceptance and use of contributions for public-private partnerships and for other purposes. Yeah, to back up a little bit, what fired me up was this this article that was from EE News, and, and it talked about not just the Sustains Act, but also a Senate bill. The Sustains Act was in the House of Representatives, oh, okay. but there was also a Grow It, oh, yep, the Growing it Climate Solutions Act, and yeah. basically there were, were two bills, both dealing with measuring greenhouse gases on a voluntary basis so that we can prove to everyone that cattle aren't harming the environment or agri. You know, the premise is, is that 18% of greenhouse gas emissions, harmful greenhouse gas emissions in America annually come from agriculture, which, you know, the first question there is, are they really harmful? Is CO2 really harmful? You know, plants breathe CO2, they grow, they emit oxygen. It seems like a hell of a partnership to me, you right. know, same with methane. There's a natural cycle, but that's where this premise, this war on beef begins is that somehow cattle are doing this. And this is uh, a solution in search of a scientifically agreed upon problem in my mind, which is all of this radical environmental stuff. But this article talked about the Senate bill and the House bill, the House bill being the Sustains Act that you just read. And yeah, the first, the first line really catches you with respect to the acceptance and use of contributions for public-private partnerships and for other purposes. So we now have a bill in government that is making legal and accepted public private partnerships. So if we stop for a minute, the reason that that offends me so much is because I think that as Americans, we are the descendants of people that fled concentrated power, be it through the church in England or the King of England. That's what we fled to. We had the people that created this country had a real power, a real fear of concentrated power. And that's why we have checks and balances built in to throughout our government. You know, co the House of Representatives is supposed to represent the people. The Senate was supposed to represent the states. The president is supposed to take all those laws, tie them together and execute them. And so they have to play on each other with checks and balances to make sure power doesn't accumulate. And what the Sustains Act does is it basically codifies concentrated power by allowing corporations and private groups to have a direct partnership with the United States government. Right. And, th and that's where I'm kind of like, before we lose people, it's like, what does that actually mean? Public private partnerships. 
that's what has been passed and and it's been passed um with under the the purposes of creating climate solutions um and so what that means is that corporations like we talk about lobbying what a problem lobbying is um what it means is corporations can just give money to the government to get what they want done done um i mean i mean to me the overall what it what it really was was just the complete just the complete and total sellout of of american agriculture it's usda hanging a shingle up saying we're for sale and and corporate ag which you know probably isn't news to a lot of people when you think about lobbyists and how much power they have in washington dc but this is straight up you can write us a check and we will get done what you need to get done and that is what this is and it's even worse than that because jim a lot of people don't realize it but when you pay your income tax you can put more on than what you owe right, right. if you owe fifteen thousand dollars in income tax you could write the federal government a check for a million dollars as it stands right now but then the government that we are supposedly elect would choose on how to spend that money and this is what's very different as you go through this bill it allows these companies to pick and choose projects, regions, and have their product their product represented within those. So they're getting an inside track. You know, I think of Shad Sullivan. He gets so upset at lobbying, but I guess I remind him I'm a lobbyist too, right? When I go to Washington, D.C., I'm an unpaid lobbyist, which makes a difference. But this makes lobbying look pretty demure yeah. because this is a direct pipeline to power. Right. And I think that's important too. I was going to say like you've, you've through RCAF, you've kind of, you've been to Washington DC, uh -huh. you've sat in those meetings, you've been to the USDA. So it's not, you know, you're not, not just a cattle feeder that, that read an article, you know, you've been there and you kind of understand this more than, more than most, more than me. Um, but to, but because I've been looking into this stuff, um, it, it really, it kind of was like a slap in the face too of, of what is really happening. Um, and then when you get looking into more of it, it's even, it's even worse than what, than what it seems like. Um, because it all like this MMRV, I, I keep reading this MMRV, they have an acronym now for what it is. And this is in all of this stuff, this climate smart stuff and, and in this, this uh what do they call this the growing climate solutions act and what it that is is measuring monitoring reporting and verification that is the end that it, to me that is the end goal of this whole thing they want that on every farm and ranch measuring monitoring reporting and verifying how much carbon you're emitting and how much carbon you're sequestering because when they can do that they can control every aspect of the operation <clears throat> Um, and I think to go back into something else you said, like all, a lot of these companies that are that are writing checks to the USDA, um, they actually have been pushing this carbon market deal for for years, you know. And this entire billion dollar thing, I mean, it's three billion plus now. Um, it's that the federal government's given, and that doesn't include the the, the private money that's come in. Um, but yeah, it's it's all about setting up these these carbon markets and this this entire new industry of of carbon. <laughs> and so it is. And I mean, just okay, Jim, I don't think we're we're specifically here to talk exactly about this bill, but this bill can be presented as evidence. The average cattleman, the average American does not realize that the prevailing winds in Washington are towards sustainability, okay? What, what, what our politicians do well now is they take a noble cause and they bastardize it. Because when you start with a, no, no, a noble cause and you bastardize it, you take away the citizen's ability to come back and say, I hate sustainability. Well, they're not saying that they hate being able to do this for generations. They're saying that they hate this power grab that you just talked about with that acronym. 
And, and that's what this is, is control. It's the one thing that a runaway government can't get enough of is control and oversight. And, and that's what this leads to is more of that. You know, another dangerous thing in this is the amount of oversight that it gives the secretary of agriculture. Yeah. Okay. I don't care if you like Tom Vilsack or if you don't like him, I, I probably have my days either way, maybe more one way than the other, but put and that it, aside. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, um, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't matter if you think he's the best ever, he's not going to be there forever. And what this bill does is it says the secretary is in charge of the whole thing. Yes. Um, of the public private partnerships. Um, and to, but to go back, I, I almost feel like, and you can tell me what you think of this, but I almost feel like the government's almost just a middleman when you talk about control. Cause when I've looked into, you know, I, I kind of focus on Tyson a lot because they're American. They're the biggest American owned, um, meat processor. And when you look at what they've done, and I came up with something because they're not listed in this this Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities projects. Um, that's the main thing I've been talking about. That was the last podcast. They're not listed in there, but I found their press release where they're getting $150 million. They're getting $62 million, and, and that's how they put it. But what it is is they're getting $62 million from the federal government, and they are putting in 40-some million um yeah 61 million this is tyson foods um this is written by john r tyson who i believe was the person who was the kid that was <laughs> stumbled into his neighbor's house drunk and got arrested not too okay. long ago. but um he is the chief sustainability officer john r tyson um and if you're wondering what that is chief sustainability officer i talk about esg a lot and the E and the S are kind of easy to, to talk about. The E is environmental, so it's all this climate stuff. The S is social, so it's your diversity, equity, inclusion, all the race and gender talk that's going on in corporate America. That's what the S is. The G is the governance, and that is how they are instituting and, and their employees and the p members on their board. So all these corporations that this ESG thing is being pushed on, the, they have to have a chief sustainability officer. They have to have a climate person on their board. Um, and that is who John R. Tyson is for, for Tyson Foods. And he says, in addition to USDA's $61 million investment, Tyson Foods is investing $42 million to accelerate the adoption and implementation of climate smart practices um, and support underserved, you know, and then it goes on and on. But um, I don't know. It, it, that's weird to me to see because that was not listed at all in the climate smart workbook tyson's name isn't up there a whole lot but um just to kind of to make sure people kind of understand what this is this is tyson foods you know they're they're putting in 40 million they're getting back 60 million and they're calling it all 152 million dollar grant and they have just partnered with the usda to force these climate practices on the industry i know i interrupted you there um no i mean when you say government almost seems like a middleman, you're absolutely right. You know, governments were supposed to have a limited role. A government's job is supposed to be to protect our rights as, as citizens. And I, I love Harriet Hageman's explanation that, you know, for a generation or two, we just raised our families, we worked hard, we paid our taxes, and we thought that things were being taken care of when actually there was a whole bunch of mischief going on. Um, you know, we're, we're, I don't think Jim, we're not here today talking about this to depress people. We just want people to be informed that number one, this is not a partisan thing. Okay. Everybody blames Biden. Well, guess what? Uh, the, the Senate bill that put into place a lot of the sustainable push passed like 92 to eight or something like that. A lot of Republicans voted for that too. Uh, the Sustains Act, as you said, that never went to a debate on the floor of the House of Representatives. It got tucked into an omnibus and just got sucked through, just like the repeal of MCOOL, right? Everybody gets mad. You voted against MCOOL. No, I didn't. I voted for the omnibus. That's how politics is played in Washington, D.C. So really, I think 
what we're trying to do here. We're trying to show them that it's not partisan, that this is real, that there's proof that this is real. And, and you know, Jim, we, we talk about Climate Smart Commodity Program. That's what you and I started talking about a lot. You know, this money that was handed out, that was federal money that came from the America Rescue Plan. Hey, we've got $3.1 billion. What to do? Let's create this new program to measure, monitor, verify, whatever that acronym mm-hmm. was that you said. Report. And then, they, That's... Yeah, and then they have the Sustains Act that legalizes these public-private partnerships to come in. To add to that, uh, we've, we've had the NAC issue now, the natural asset company issue, that is what is probably the greatest victory that America has had that nobody knows anything about because the media has not covered that you know, where they wanted to uh, measure, quantify, monetize natural processes via the UN accounting system that they wanted the SEC to allow the New York Stock Exchange to use to allow trading of these things by any entity in the world could trade on that. You know, these are very real issues and they're at play right now. So we have to figure out a way to push back against them. And I think that that NAC issue is probably the NAC victory is probably the roadmap to success because we had state attorney generals, we had state treasurers, we had congressmen and a handful of groups that pushed back on that and beat it back. And I think that's what this is going to be. Step by step. So Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, way back before we had fossil fuels, right? I mean, whatever, before we knew what CO2 was, whatever. He said, avoid foreign entanglements. And that's what this is, is a foreign entanglement to the nth degree. All of this sustainability stuff is ultimately driven by the UN that's coming into our government. It's convincing the people in D.C. that this is a good idea because we have to save the earth, even though there is a lot of disagreement among scientists if we are increasing CO2, how much, whether it's really deleterious to the health of the earth. Um, So that's the first thing that we have to realize. And I know that that seems dark and it seems uphill, but we're, we're seeing Congress more and more in Congress starting to wake up. I mean, let's face it, 31 congressmen got that NAC issue pushed back. And so I think we just have to really let it settle in upon us that this is real. This is their way of coming after, you know, this country, what is it? We're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights among those being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And governments are instituted amongst men to protect those rights, those three, the big three. Well, this is an attack on our property rights, Jim, because basically this whole framework that's being built is a way of making Americans and farmers across the globe, anybody that makes anything, earn the right to do, to be productive that they've been doing for generations. And if that's not an attack on property rights, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's and yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and that's what I was thinking about how you know the cattle business. It, the reason why this is focused on agriculture is because I feel like we are the 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 largest number of just the most independent people in America as far as small businesses go. Um, you know there are and and it's dwindling, and I think they're loving it. <laughs> you know. Um, But, but yeah, and it's kind of like, there isn't really another business where you can go to the sale barn and you can buy something and you can bring it home and you can feed it whatever you want and get it pat and take it back to the sale barn and make money and have no government interference and no controls over that. Um, You know, as far as a large number of people that are able to do it Um, and, and there's less and less all the time, but but I feel like that's why there's this focus on agriculture because there is so much independence here. Well, I mean, and that's, that's the pep talk that I give cattlemen when I get a chance to speak to them. I think a lot of them feel victimized by this, but really, and they are, (laughs) but, 
it's kind of a compliment that there's a war on beef. Why is there a war on beef? It's because number one, we own the land. We have the means of production. We're the ones with the generational knowledge of how to do it. We're the most independent people left in America, which makes it really hard to be in an organization, right? Because everybody has their own ideas and it's hard to get people to band together. Uh, we're independent. We're hardworking. We're God-fearing. We cling to God and guns. We're, we're everything that a strong central government hates. I wouldn't say hate. It's, it's what they're up against as far as getting more and more control over the average citizen. It's because we've lived so free. It just drives them crazy, Jim. I, right. I think just maybe oversimplify it. It I, drives the technocrats crazy that I can own land. I can decide what to do with it. I can raise the kind of cattle that I want. And my, my only ask is that I have a competitive market for me to take what I've grown and sell based on the merit of what I've produced. Right. And that's what a government, that's what freedom is, Jim. And that's, you know, look, look at the history of centralized control, right? Stalin, how many millions did he kill with centralized control? Because he knew better. Shoot the farmers, take all the seeds, do it my way. Mao, I think, was maybe even more successful than Stalin. And, and that's happened in the last 80 years. So that's kind of what we're up against here. It never feels like it when you're going into it. But once you're so far into it that you can't turn back, I think it gets to be obvious. And that's what we're trying to get away from here. Yeah. And that's and that's the hard thing to understand. I think for a lot of people that they hear this kind of stuff and it's kind of like, why? You know, because it's it's and it's always been hard for me to wrap my head around you know, in my last deal, I talked about growing up in the nineties and hearing Al Gore talk about how the world's going to end. And it's kind of like, and you know, and then I had this other, this other side who was telling me that he just wants to control everything. And so it's like, I don't, it's still hard for me to wrap get my head around. Like, why would somebody implement this stuff just to get control of our farm, you know, or our land or what I'm doing? Why do those, but, the, but those people are there. And they want to do it and they, and they create, you know, a following and they get people to work. Um, they get people to work for them. And, and in agriculture, I feel like too, I, you know, I heard from somebody who said they got a friend, I did a video on dairy farmers of America um, and how they're all in on this ESG thing and, and they're selling their carbon credits and how it's kind of all a bunch of BS. But I, and I got somebody told me he knew somebody that worked at dairy farmers of America and, and that what I was saying was wrong pretty much. But I'm, I was thinking, you know, we have these people who, um, you know, kids really who get out of, they want to be involved in agriculture. And now really the easiest Avenue and one of the only avenues left is to join a corporation like this. And you get in there and you sit in on these ESG meetings and the DEI meetings and, and all this stuff. And you come out thinking, well, this is what we have to do. Um, and when you look at, so these are the kids coming out of college, like South Dakota state university, which is what I talked about, which is where it, a lot of this money is going, which I think needs to be talked about too. A lot of this money is going into ag departments where your kids are being taught that the only way to, to be successful when they come home is to be in this carbon market and to sign up for all this stuff and to record all your carbon emissions and everything. Um, and, and it's a real problem and it's a problem that that I don't think people, you know, even I have a hard time wrapping my head around it, but, but you have to realize that this is what's going on. <laughs> um, um, and it is hard for people to understand. It's hard for me to understand. Um, but, and, and another thing that makes it hard to understand, and maybe you could go into this a little bit more is now this is a podcast of a couple of guys, you know, in Iowa and South Dakota talking about this bill that is changing the face of agriculture. It is complete. This bill is completely changing agriculture. This $3 billion project is completely changing the way agriculture operates. And the only people talking about it are me and Brett Kenzie sitting in our houses in Iowa and South Dakota. Um, do you have an answer to why that is? Sure. I just, I just transcribed it this morning. Okay. I've got to read it to you because I'm not, I'm not smart enough to, uh, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to do it off the top of my head. 
Tucker Carlson was over in Dubai. I think it was Dubai, UAE, wherever. He was overseas talking to a very diverse group. And he started talking about media. And this is a really rough transcription. I can't type as fast as he can talk. Media information in a free country is a counterbalance against entrenched power. So let that soak in for a minute. Media is a counterbalance against entrenched power. Not just government power, but economic power, business. It's, our government was constitutionally designed as a counterbalance to that. So if sources of media information, news outlets align with entrenched power, so media and entrenched power coupled together, then you have a powerless population, then it's totalitarian, and that's the direction the U.S. is headed. It's a perilous moment. If we're a democracy, a prerequisite for democracy is information so that the electorate can make up its mind and decide who to choose. It's it sounds so simple and common sense, but it's what we've let get away from us. It's why I say that the the victory over the Max was the greatest victory for America that nobody knows about. No, everybody gives you a blank stare when you talk about natural asset companies, and we beat that back. And now they've renamed it, and they're coming back again. Right? They're going to keep coming with this because there's a lot of money, there's a lot of power. America is in the bullseye of the global elites. If they can come in and, and hollow America out, then the rest of the world will follow in short order. That's that's what I think. I re- I watched that thing too. And we had talked about too that we, but that quote jumped out to both of us because when we heard it, we thought about agriculture. And that did not, then, you know, when you hear um, sources of media information, news outlets align with entrenched power, then you have a powerless population. Then it's totalitarian. That's um, that's what came out. That As soon as I heard that, the term I thought about was sustainability. Entrenched power has aligned with government power and has pushed this sustainability thing. Um, you know, and it's not just media either. It's also the associations. But you talk about agriculture media, and it's 100% pushed by corporations. And all the corporations, John Deere is all in on this deal. The ESG thing, they have a di- they have John Deere has a pronoun page on uh, a section of their website where they talk about <laughs> what pronouns they can use in their in their organization. Um, and, and these are the advertisers in all of media. So you're not going to get anybody in ag media who's going to push back on this, but also Farm Bureau, American Farm Bureau is for this climate smart initiative. They are for the corporations pumping money into this deal. Um, you know, I, I have a thing here that I've had since Christmas. This is JBS's, um, sustainability, or he's the head of corporate affairs. His name's Cameron Bruett. I've been warned, and th- and he was the keynote speaker at Iowa Cattlemen's Association, the JBS, the most co- the most corrupt corporation in the world. They have the biggest. Uh, everybody keeps saying Pfizer has the biggest fine, and it's less than three billion dollars. I think JBS has the biggest fine um, for cor- for corruption because they they bribed. Thousands of, of politicians in Brazil, including the president, um, and their their owners went to to prison for it. Um, and nobody talks about that. They just talk about how great the sustainability is going to be. And they bring in, you know, somebody from the worst corporation in the world to talk to them at Iowa Cattlemen's Association. Um, and and you talk about entrenched power and how it's it's really taken over. Um, and it, it, it's really hard <laughs> Um, it's hard to get, it's hard to wrap your head around and to wonder why nobody else is talking about it, but that's it. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's making a lot of people scratch their head, but I'm hoping a lot of people are waking up. But we've got to invite new people to come in, tell them that they matter. Their families matter. Their ranch matters. Their small business on main street America matters. Their small business on in New York city matters, whatever. That's what makes America function is small business and competition because that's what fosters work ethic and entrepreneurialism and new ideas. And, and this Jim is exactly the wrong way. This is Mao Zedong. 
this is style, right. this direction. And, and, and I would love to have somebody tell me that I'm wrong. And they're going to yeah. say, oh, but we're killing the earth. And just like you led into in Rapid City, being a little kid listening to Rush Limbaugh, that I, who was it that you said, said the world would be unrecognizable in 10 United years. Nations. It was a quote from the United oh, Nations. Okay. To, to tie it in, United Nations came up, wrote the ESG plan. The United Nations came up with the idea of cattle being bad for the environment. United Nations may have wrote this bill. As far as we know, that's what I was going to ask. You were holding the bill up and talking about the guys whose names are on it. Do you have any idea of, of where this would have come from or how this, because to me, it's like, it has to be, and I have a pretty good example of, of who wrote it. Um, because I went into, I mean, I guess you can go off of that and then I'll give my example. Well, I, I haven't gone as far down the United Nations route, but you know, Ava Lerdinger broke from the Netherlands at the RCAF convention. She put up those sustainable goals, the UN 2030 mm -hmm. sustainable goals. And yeah, this is, you, you can tell by the language. It's almost its own dialect, the words that these yep. people use. And it's and funny seeing... that you look at natural asset company verbiage and it matches the verbiage in the Sustains Act or in the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And so I, I feel ultimately that the UN is at the base of all this because the, the real oversimplified Brett Kinsey view of the UN is that's where failed national leaders go to regain power. And they're all putting their heads together to overpower every sovereign nation in the world. I mean, people think that we hate Mexico. No, we, we love Mexico. We want Mexico to be a strong nation and a good neighbor. The same with Canada, the same with every nation in the world. But that's what the UN gets at is they want to override the sovereignty of every nation and play those nations against each other until we're all in the ash heap of history, so to speak, right. for them to rule over. Um, but to go in, like I talked about, they wrote the ESG plans that all these corporations are pushing in. And there's a quote I keep going back to. I know I focus on Tyson Foods, but it's the same thing that's in everyone's ESG plan, which is scope three. And what scope three is, is suppliers, carbon emissions, meaning farmers and ranchers, carbon, carbon emissions. They are the suppliers for Tyson Foods. And in Tyson Foods ESG report, they write Tyson Foods, will also refine scope three, meaning farmers and ranchers, greenhouse gas emissions, estimates and goals as supplier data and standardized methodologies for calculations across industry sectors become available. And so they want standardized methodologies, calculations across industry sectors. What the, um, there's a website called Decode 6, and they broke down this uh, Growing Climate Solutions Act, and I'll put a link to this, and they're all for it. Um, but they kind of break down what it is, and it is supports developing standards for measuring, monitoring, and verifying GH greenhouse gas reduction and carbon sequestr sequestration. Um, and that's one of the main things. It says calls for creating an online portal housed by USDA that connects farmers with experts to facilitate carbon markets, provides farmers with verified carbon market qualified vendor information. It's all the same stuff. It's as if Tyson Foods wrote it. Um, and it's just like that climate smart, climate smart, um, the actual projects that are being pushed out with it, that all their money is being spent on. They put $42 million in. Um, and I actually went through that, the whole climate smart project thing. And I added it up because I couldn't find it anywhere. How much the actual, the, the public, you know, or the, the private sector, meaning these giant agriculture corporations, how much they put in. And it was, I have it here. If they okay. were proud, you think there would be a link. Yeah, I know. Well, I've actually emailed the them. I, I've actually emailed them and I did it not too long ago. So I haven't, you know, I'm not expecting to get it back, but um, I asked them who, there should be a list of who contributed and how much they contributed. Right. And that should be public knowledge. Um, and I've asked them for it, but who knows? But the total contributions was seven hundred million sixty two or yeah, seven hundred sixty two million five hundred and ninety 
and sixteen dollars. So three quarters of a billion is what um, the agriculture industry has contributed to get farmers and ranchers to monitor, measure, report, and verify their carbon emissions. That's what's being pushed on this deal. Um, and so that's uh, we got three million dollars from. Go ahead. I have to repeat myself that. Uh, for the last five years of my life, for sure, probably more, I have fought against the concentration of industry because it creates undue economic power. Concentrated power is undue economic power and it's undue government power, right? Power over the market, power in terms of lobbying in D.C. And, you know, Tom Vilsack in, in the Sustains Act, the, at the discretion of the secretary, at the discretion of the secretary, everything's at the discretion of the secretary. Tom Vilsack has had the ability to enforce the Packers and Stockyards Act for all these years, not to punish anybody, but just to create a competitive and transparent market. And I've failed at that. And they finally have gotten enough power that they can directly just partner with government now. It almost makes you wonder if, is lobbying deductible? Yeah, is is yeah. this deductible? You right. know, it's a. Do, well, do yeah. you call this an advertising expense? What what what? Not where did these corporations put the seven hundred and sixty two million dollars in their balance sheet? Exactly. I yeah. mean, we is know it's one hell of a USDA a nonprofit now. Because, or, yeah. Because That's look at what you've got. You've got seven hundred and sixty two million dollars wagging the tail of three point one billion taxpayer dollars right that's why it's a conflict of interest yeah and you know going back to you talk about you know the last three years we've been talking about collusion in the cattle market and it's been a big um you know issue but looking at this it's like it i mean it's just this is collusion in the entire corporate america i mean this is every corporation every publicly traded corporation in America has their sustainability report, which I've realized now I've been searching ESG reports. Well, they don't have those anymore. They're, they're all just called sustainability reports. And that goes back to, I think what you were talking about, because people are realizing what ESG is, it's a form of control. Um, but if you call it sustainability, well, then you can't talk about bad about that because you don't want your kids on your place. You're against sustainability. I mean, that's, that's what you were saying earlier. Um, it's important to mention too, Jim, just how long this has been in the works, right? Yeah, I know. That's what surprised me too. You know, the, I, I would say that we have to define all of these discussions as pre-NAC, pre-natural asset company and post-natural asset company one way or the other, because when they tried to come out and have the SEC allow trading of natural asset companies, by the New York Stock Exchange, they had to show their cards. And so before that, this was all just kind of a conspiracy theory thing, right? Oh, yeah, they're saying it, but they don't mean it. It's just they're doing their thing. But now we see that, yes, this is sustainability weaponized. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look back, you know, RCAF started fighting. The furthest back that I could find was 2006. We started fighting mandatory EID. That's how long. They've wanted to know how many cattle we had. And, you know, that could be anything. That could be just for pure trading purposes. But we've seen it evolve into, I think, 2013 was when we saw the checkoff and the World Wildlife Federation partner on that sustainability study. Um, it's when we saw, oh, I can't remember the acronym. It's a global body that has sustainability plans. It was in 2013. But at any rate, it was a long checklist of what would be required for cattlemen to be sustainable. And the number one thing on the checklist was mandatory or traceability, right. traceability. And so now we've seen the advent of this, this USDA preoccupation almost with, with traceability. They're using disease control as as the precept of that, but I think we all know where it's going as we're talking about measuring, monitoring, verifying 
there are things that can be done to push back against this. And maybe the one that's up front right now is mandatory ID. Right. My brother talked to a, a young man from Estonia. He went over there. He was a, a broker in Wall Street, amassed a lot of money. When the Soviet bloc broke up, he went to Estonia, bought a bunch of ground and started building a place. He was back in the United States. My brother had a chance to visit with him. He said, there's two things you can never let him do. Never let him take your competitive markets and never, ever let him require traceability of your livestock. Really? And so that's from somebody that we hadn't seen for 20 years. Right. Yeah. From he had no idea what was even going on. Yes. Complete different country. That's how important this is. And that's, that's our action step here, I think, or that's our calf's action step. Uh, yeah. And I, I think, but you, you said one thing that kind of triggered what I, 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 I would disagree with. Cause you said it's becoming clear to people. I don't know how clear it is. I think the big push on, at the NCBA convention was how this is going to push out small producers that aren't able to tag. You know, if you're listening to Feeder Flash, you know, he was getting people wound up at sale barns because the sale barns are going to have a lot of extra work to do, things like that. That was the main push I heard against the EID tag. It wasn't that they are going, you know, the information that they're eventually going to require that's being pushed put on these EID tags. And that's what I think people really need to to think about. And I also think people need to think about, and we talked about the last three years and, and all the things that happened in the cattle market. And we've had these Senate hearings and all these different things. And every single time the NCBA people got in there or people that aligned with NCBA got in there, they said, cattle guys don't like mandates. Cattle guys don't like regulation. We don't want to regulate the market. We don't want to regulate, you know, we're all about freedom. We're all, we don't want to have these regulations on the market, this 5014 bill. And now all of a sudden we want to have, we want to mandate a tag in every single animal's ear that can, that can hold all kinds of information on our operations. Um, it's, it's insane that they're getting away with that and being able to say that, you know, and it, it just kind of goes to show who they are where they can say that. And then they can just turn around in the next year or two and be like, we hate mandates and we don't want any regulations, but here's what you have to do on your operation. Because it, what it is is they hate mandates and regulations on the market, or the or the in the beef side. They're showing they're working for the beef side. They're showing that they work for the beef side. They don't work at all for the cattle side. That's what it shows to me. I agree with you, and I'm glad that you brought that up because that's really important. When I say that now we know, right? I I think that. You know, a lot of this is just having a principle. We were we had a principled opposition to registering our livestock with the government. The people who have been fighting mandatory ID out of their own pocket, mind you. We're fighting the government out of our own pockets. A few of us. Right. You know, and it, it's it's hard not to get pissed off at the people beside you who just think that politics crap is boring. But you just keep going because you're, you're working for something positive. And I think now, now that this has come out, now I think that everybody can see that that control aspect of registering your livestock with the government, it's easy to see now what the plan is. In terms of the NCBA, that whole resolution kerfluffle that went on. I stayed out of it as RCAF because I think that everybody knows that we're against it and it's not our job to go try and tell NCBA what to believe. But man, you want to talk about a shot in the arm of confidence right. for RCAF to see these people who know nothing about RCAF, don't ever want to be a member of RCAF, finally get it and start to push back on their own to see these livestock auction markets get going. And Jim, I think that now people have seen this. They've seen that they haven't gotten rid of it entirely, but they made a difference. They're hungry now. So let's feed them, <laughs> let's feed them the fact that NCBA was a warm-up for the battle. The battle is with right. USDA because USDA is the one that's going to put the mandate on you. Yep. And that's it's, that goes back to you know, you've been doing this for years and years, and I keep telling people. Like the, I like bringing people like you on because you forgot more than I'll ever know about these kind of issues and, and the cattle business. But 
just over these years and, and opening my eyes, um, you, you know, it kind of leads you down a path where you're like, well, NCB, you know, here's the problem. It's NCBA. Well, what funds NCBA? Well, it's a checkoff. Well, who oversees the entire checkoff? It's USDA. USDA, <laughs> you know, and now USDA is being funded practically. You know, they're having large checks written to them um, by these corporations. And so, yeah, here we are. And, and, and you're going to trust back. them. You're yeah. going to trust them now. You know, if, if things were different as far as a track record with USDA, and I'm not talking just about Tom Vilsack, I'm talking about over several administrations, just like you say, USDA oversees import standards, which have been decreased at least four times over the last 20 years. USDA has great sway over trade. USDA has great sway, as you said, over the checkoff, over labeling, over enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act. But now, given that track record, we want to register our cattle with that same USDA, that same USDA. And it's people know in their gut that it's not right. The question that's upon right. us if they will care enough. And I'm not saying you have to join my organization, that organization, you can do it on your own if you have a phone, but you need to call your congressman and tell them, no way, no way. We already have a way to trace disease. This is about sustainability, radicalized sustainability, and we're not going there. Right. And when you get approached, because you you sent me an email um, where you were sub Trutera, contacted you about you know that's the other thing i'd want to say is you know say no way on mandatory id but also say no way on these these programs um that they're trying to get people to sign up for um tutera is owned by lando lakes you sent you got an email i think from tutera to to sign up for carbon market which came which came from farm journal okay <laughs> yeah they're all tied in because they're I all subscribe. working together yeah, I get and, Drover's emails, and so then I get Farm Journal's emails, and then I get the solicitation emails. Yeah. And, and, it's and a, you see these these company names, and and a lot of it's like Tutera, um, like you know, it's like, well, who's that? It's just some small company that's worried about the environment. No, it's Lando Lakes. <laughs> it's one of the biggest egg, you know, corporations or food supplying corporations there is that that want to monitor your carbon emissions. Um, and another one of these projects talks about how they it's uh, it's they're setting up a financial deal um, to. It's called the Climate Smart Agriculture Innovative Finance Initiative. And what it is, I talk about how this is setting up a system, but what that is, is setting up a system where banks can can monitor or, or regulate your interest rates based on your carbon emissions. Um, and, and if you're involved in these programs, um, and so I would say, yeah, that, you know, push back on mandatory ID, but also do not get involved in these programs and they're going to try to pay people, you know, they got a ton of money and then uh, I'm sure they're already trying, but even after my deal, um, in South Dakota there, my last podcast, I've had people reach out that are already signed up on this thing. And they're kind of like, what did I do? <laughs> you know? And so that's good. It's good to hear people's eyes are opening, but you know, you don't want to end up being one of those people looking back down the road and being like, oh, this is the system I created. Well, it's kind of like the people who have done conservation easements, right? Mm -hmm. It's always a trusted person that comes out to visit with you about them. And I mean, to you, it's farm ground or it's grazing ground. And that's its highest use. It's highest use in your mind. And you're never going to sell it. And you ne you're never going to develop it. So what, what harm is there in selling a conservation easement on that to keep it from being developed? Well, that's what they sell to you. And the guy that comes out to you, he probably believes when he's selling you or when he's giving you money to sign that conservation easement, that that's the use of that. But the problem is, is the guy that that guy, the good guy works for, he might not even be in on the grift, but they take these things and they trade them around and ultimately it ends up in, say, the Nature Conservancy's hands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of the Sustains Act, if I can find it here looking real quick. 
page four, line 19, rules for easements. You know, we were just talking about easements and how easy it is to get lured into putting an easement on your ground. And we, and we learned through the NAC, the natural asset company fight that we were just in, that those easements can be pulled in and the natural benefits of those can be sold and, and you're just out. But it says right here, the rules for easements. An easement funded pursuant to this subsection shall be subject to the requirements of the covered program for which the contributed funds were used, except that the secretary may modify such requirements as they apply to the easement for the purpose of addressing climate change as the secretary determines appropriate. So that basically just says that we give the secretary to do anything he thinks is right in regards to these easements and, and you know to the secretary's discretion as he deems necessary is in this sustains act so many times and really that's the fault of congress in a way sometimes we blame the ag secretary for obligations that Congress has passed his way to avoid accountability because an ag secretary is not elected. Congressmen are elected. And by passing all this power from Congress's hands to the secretary, that's just, that's how the bureaucracy gets so powerful and way too big and way too well funded. How do we look at our kids and know that I see estimates from every hundred to 165 days, we're adding another trillion dollars to the deficit. That's $20,000 of liability per family in America right now. Every 100 to 165 days, another trillion, another trillion. And uh, at, at some point, this has to stop. Yeah. So do you want the bright part of all this, Jim? <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's the end her on bright part, now. Let's end the her on bright, bright part of every problem that we've talked about here today and so many of the other problems in America that has people, I mean, you want to talk about an, an addicted suicidal society. It's sad. It's heartbreaking, homelessness, people that have just given up every problem that America has today. It's done to itself. Yeah. Yeah. Now that might not seem bright, but th there is hope in that, that if Americans can take it upon themselves and people get tired of hearing me say it and they don't like it, and I don't like to say it honestly, but this country will never be more than the sum of the efforts of its citizens. So let's go. Right. Act like an American. Take it personal. Yeah. That's what I say. It's my country. It's your country. And if we, if we want government to be different, we're going to have to take it upon ourselves to make it different. All right. That was Brett Kinsey. Uh, I wanted to say a big thank you to him for coming on here. Um, and after, after listening to what he had to say, one of the things that really stuck with me is, is his quote where he talked about entrenched power and how, how that combination with media creates a powerless population. Um, that, that term powerless population is it kind of stuck with me because of when you think I think there's some people in agriculture that are that are looking at this carbon deal and and they're kind of like if you can't beat them join them um, and so so I guess my message out there would be to to you know that that works the other way also if you have a a media that does not work with entrenched power um, you can create a powerful population um, and so. On that note, I would say share the podcast, um, like, subscribe, do all those things. If you want to, um, I now have a subscriber page. If you want to support Lonesome Lands and what we're doing here and, and help us grow, you can go there. Um, that'll be in the, in, in the description here. Um, I'm already working on the next one, so it should be out soon. Stay tuned.